Hi, Calvary Church. My name is Brad Huddleston. Laura has asked me to spend a few minutes with you sharing the concept of digital cocaine for all of the families at Calvary Church. I've been researching, writing, and speaking on this topic for about 18 years. And my prayer is that the information that I share with you will bless you and equip you more as a parent. Before we dive into this topic, I think it would be a good idea to introduce myself. I've been married to Beth for 30 years. We live in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the state of Virginia here in the U.S. I'm a researcher and author, and my latest book is titled Digital Cocaine, A Journey Toward Eye Balance. Now, prior to COVID, I've spent the past 20 years traveling all over the world ministering and speaking to hundreds of thousands on both the advantages of well-used technology tools and the dangers of technology addiction. Since the year 2000, I've spent several months each year in Australia working with law enforcement, speaking in churches, schools, and I've spent a good deal of time on the ABC and on television news speaking about technology's effects on our culture. I'm very honored to be a regular guest on Vision Radio. And in South Africa, one of my stops is at the University of South Africa, where I'm in collaboration with the Bureau of Market Research and its Neuroscience Division. I've been privileged to appear on Carte Blanche, the Espresso Show, Radio Pulpit, and a ton more. And I know Calvary has a church in East London. I've ministered in East London, and several years ago I did a speaking tour with Algoa FM. Our books and videos can be found in Australia at Kurong and Vision Media and at Coom Books in South Africa. You know, Beth and I cannot wait for this pandemic to end so that we can get back to both Australia and South Africa. We really, really miss being with you. Well, what do you say we get started? The first thing I want to say is that I am not against technology. Because the cover of my book is so confronting, some folks might get the idea that I hate technology. Not so. I have a four-year degree in computer science, and I did not renounce it when I discovered how harmful technology can be. Now, as helpful as science can be, I would never recommend that you put your ultimate trust in it. I believe the scriptures are without error, and they are the final authority for all faith and conduct. So let's look at what the Bible has to say about the issues of life, and that includes technology. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything, which means to be brought under its power, allowing it to control us. In other words, we can have pleasurable things in life, unless we find ourselves addicted. And that's the line in the sand that the Lord has drawn for us. You know, that's where neuroscience can be very helpful. And I want to begin by showing you some brain animations that I designed that are based on a very helpful book by Dr. Archibald Hart, and it's titled Thrilled to Death, How the Endless Pursuit of Pleasure is Leaving Us Numb. That little dot represents an area in the brain called the nucleus accumbens, or the pleasure center. Whenever we engage in stimulating activities, good and bad, a neurotransmitter called dopamine is released into the pleasure center, and we like that. It feels good. And there's nothing wrong with dopamine until we release too much. When too much dopamine floods the brain, it begins to build up resistance or tolerance. And that's what that growing barrier or wall represents. The brain is trying to push out the excessive amounts of dopamine, and we don't like for those pleasurable feelings to be cut off. So what do we do when the wall keeps us from feeling pleasure? Well, we do more and more of the stimulating activity. And while we can eventually saturate the wall with dopamine and get our fix, the wall just keeps growing. Eventually, we habituate to that activity, or to put it simply, we're now addicted. Eventually, the wall gets so big that it blocks out all of the dopamine and we become emotionally numb. That's a medical condition called anhedonia. Have you ever heard your kids or grandkids say, I'm bored, and you think to yourself, how in the world could you be bored? You have more toys, activities, and technology than I ever had growing up. Chances are that child has a wall in their brain from too much stimulation from digital devices, and that includes television. And you can see the results of addiction on brain scans. In his book, Glow Kids, 
how screen addiction is hijacking our kids, Dr. Nicholas Cardaris wrote the following. An ever-increasing amount of clinical research correlates screen tech with psychiatric disorders like ADHD, addiction, anxiety, depression, increased aggression, and even psychosis. Perhaps most shocking of all, recent brain imaging studies conclusively show that excessive screen exposure can neurologically damage a young person's developing brain in the same way that cocaine addiction can. Excessive screen time is not just an issue with kids. Take a guess what the average age of a video gamer in Australia is. According to the Australia Federal Police, it's 34. Here in the U.S., the average age range is 35 to 44, and marriages all over the world are suffering as a result. In my global travels, I've encountered this firsthand. I want to read an email to you that I recently received. And by the way, I was granted permission by this mom to use this in my presentations. I'm a mother of five, married to a man who has an addiction and has suffered trauma. I need guidance. He is separated from me because I brought up the video games and we had a big fight. And this was my response. My heart goes out to you. Thank you for trusting us. This problem is very common as the average age of video gamers is 35 to 44. Marriages all over the world are in turmoil because of this very issue. Video gaming addiction is similar to cocaine addiction. The brain scans clearly show this. And that's why my book is titled Digital Cocaine. An addict can only receive help when they rid themselves of all excuses, admit they have the addiction, and ask for help. You are not wrong in complaining to your husband. If you are part of a church, I recommend that you contact some of the senior men who are not video gamers and implore their help to confront your husband based on the following scripture. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. You see, my point in bringing this up is that you obviously can't have a policy with your children that communicates, do as I say, not as I do. Parents have to set the example. Generally speaking, video gaming is a guy thing, but mothers also struggle with excessive screen time. I let that video play for a long time on purpose. Based on the previous reactions of my audiences, I'm guessing that some of you, particularly if you're female, might have been thinking something like, okay, Brad, um, you can stop the video now. I, I get the point. That's enough. Now look, I I'm not trying to condemn you. Not at all. As you know, change doesn't happen until we face the uncomfortable truth and the convicting but loving hand of our Heavenly Father. The good news is that when we have the courage to face the truth, Jesus can then do a wonderful thing for us. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is not a beat up. This is a free up. You see, God is never too busy to pull us up on His lap when we need Him, and 
He wants parents to model that to their children. You know, I would go so far as to say that the best gift you could ever give your children is your undivided attention on a consistent basis. And then communicate to their little hearts that God is never too busy for them. Let's talk about the general symptoms of digital addiction. You know as well as I do that a phone or tablet is the best babysitter in the world, bar none. And it works better than any human, and it's cheap. All of that is fine and dandy until it comes time to take the device away. And what reaction do you get? That's right, anger, tantrums, and as more time passes, you might even see aggression start to develop. The second symptom is anxiety and depression. So not only can screen time cause anxiety and depression, but if a child already has these conditions, screen time in any amount can exasperate these emotional landmines. Fourthly, attention deficits. Consider this article from the Cleveland Clinic entitled Preschooler Screen Time Linked to Attention Problems. Researchers found by age five, children who spent two hours or more per day looking at screens were 7.7 times more likely to meet criteria for a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD than children who watch screens for 30 minutes or less each day. Number five, sleep loss. The Sleep Foundation gives excellent insight in their article, Screen Time and Insomnia, What It Means for Teens. The National Sleep Foundation's 2014 Sleep in the Modern Family poll found that three in four teenagers and 96% of teenagers between the ages of 15 and 17 bring some kind of technology into the bedroom. In total, the average adolescent gets up to nine hours of screen time per day. What are the consequences of sleep deprivation for teens? Sleep deprivation during adolescence can cause problems with mood, emotion, and academic performance. Teens who don't sleep well are more likely to have problems with their peers, and chronic sleep loss can lead to a weakened immune system, depression, and suicidal thoughts. And lastly, emotional numbness or anhedonia or boredom. I can't stress enough how important it is for all family members to remove all technology, and that includes television from their bedrooms and sleep consistently night after night. So how much sleep is recommended for each age group? According to the Sleep Foundation, school-aged children need nine to 11 hours, teenagers need eight to 10 hours, young adults need seven to nine hours, and adults also need seven to nine hours of sleep. The lockdowns have forced the whole world into homeschooling, and it's not been going well. Everything from falling grades to mental health issues is causing tremendous concerns. For example, in Australia, the ABC reported on a Mission Australia survey that showed Victoria's young are anxious about COVID-19's impact on education. More than 900 young people said COVID-19 impacted education, isolation, and mental health with 17-year-olds in senior school particularly worried about their education. And here in the U.S., the New York Times reported that as school moves online, many students stay logged out. Teachers at some schools across the country report fewer than half of their students are participating in online learning. In Philadelphia, it was reported that only 61% of students attended on an average day, and in Boston, only 50% of students were logging in or submitting assignments. Now, just because students were not logging into their education platforms didn't mean that they were not online. They were. Netflix, YouTube, and pornography sites saw massive increases in traffic, and video gaming has been at an all-time high during COVID-19. So parents, here's what I have to say about that. If you are forced back into lockdown and you have to work from home and your kids have to learn online, there are no walkaway solutions for your kids. In other words, you can't just put your child in front of a screen, log into an education platform, and then walk away and assume they will stay on task. 
the vast majority of students will drift to online entertainment and social media platforms. You'll have to either sit with them, or pay someone to sit with them. You just got to get creative. I know this is hard, and believe me, my heart goes out to you. And even though your children are likely spending endless hours on social media with their friends, it's not the same as being in the physical presence of other people. That's why students are worried about isolation, depression, and suicidal thoughts. And my strong recommendation is that during lockdowns, you make loads of time to be with your children with no technology on. You should play lots of board games, card games, just talking. You get the idea. God has designed the family to be the most satisfying comfort and emotional support there is. So if you're isolated, you can actually turn this around and be intentional to take advantage of newfound family time. But this will not happen if everyone is in the same room but on their devices at the same time. Let's talk about more solutions. I've already mentioned no technology in bedrooms, proper sleep, setting the example for your children, and not walking away if your kids have to study online. In fact, your children should never ever be left alone with an internet connected device, period. But let's move on. If you are addicted, you must detox first. In other words, if you are addicted to technology, strategies to balance tech use will not work. You must detox first and then attempt to achieve eye balance. So how long does it take to detox? Well, a minimum, a minimum of four to six weeks. And during that time, no screens at all, including television. So then you return to limited screen time using a much different definition of limit than the arbitrary one that you might have been going by. Let me show you what I mean. If I were to grab the phone or tablet of any child or teenager, I would find educational apps such as Google Sheets, Docs, Excel, PowerPoint, Word, but I would also find things such as Fortnite, Google Classroom, Netflix, Minecraft, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, pornography, and YouTube. There's a verse in the Bible that helps us to understand what limit actually means. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Separation is where we get the biblical idea of holiness from. It means to be separated from the secular culture and its evils and set apart for God's use. So, if we apply this concept to technology, this is what it would look like. We would separate the online activities that are causing the majority of the negative issues from the ones that are actually useful and tend to not cause digital addiction. You know, no one has ever come up to me and said, Brad, please pray for me. I'm so addicted to Word. I just can't stop typing. But many have come to me and asked for prayer for being addicted to those activities on the left side of the screen. You know what's sad? I have actually had young people ask me what they're supposed to do if they separate from those things that are causing addiction. It's sad that I have to help them be creative and think through solutions, but I do it and I'm happy to. So here's what I recommend. Replace all of those addictive activities with analog ones, such as enjoying peace of mind, worship, outdoor activities, scripture reading, and being with family and friends face to face. I think it would also be helpful to give you some advice from Silicon Valley, where most of the technology we use is invented. Have you ever wondered how tech employees raise their children? Consider this article from the New York Times titled, A Silicon Valley School That Doesn't Compute. The chief technology officer of eBay sends his children to a nine classroom school here. So do employees of Silicon Valley giants like Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewlett-Packard. But the school's chief teaching tools are anything but high-tech. Pens and paper, knitting needles, and occasionally mud. Not a computer to be found, no screens at all, they are not allowed in the classroom, and the school even frowns on their use at home. Are you aware that Steve Jobs was a low-tech parent? So your kids must love the iPad, I asked Mr. Jobs, trying to change the subject. 
they haven't used it, he told me. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. I never asked Mr. Jobs what his children did instead of using the gadgets he built, so I reached out to Walter Isaacson, the author of Steve Jobs, who spent a lot of time at their home. Every evening, Steve made a point of having dinner at the big long table in their kitchen, discussing books and history and a variety of things. He said, no one ever pulled out an iPad or computer. The kids did not seem addicted at all to devices. You know, Steve Jobs really loved his kids. Not yours, his. Well, our time is just about up. I have a lot more advice in my book, and I invite you to check it out. I'd be honored to close our time in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Calvary Church. Thank you for Laura. Thank you for a church that just loves parents and wants to equip and and help them. Father, I pray that that's exactly what you've allowed me to do during my brief time with them. These things are hard, Lord. The culture is just overwhelming us like a tsunami. But God, you told us that if we would repent, just simply turn around and go in the right direction, that our sins would be forgiven and that times of refreshing would come from the presence of God of the Lord. So Lord Jesus, would you please send your presence to all of these Calvary Church locations, their parents, equip them, God, give them a hunger as never before to be so intimate with you. So much so, Jesus, that technology would just naturally fade into the background and serve us instead of us serving it. So Lord, if there's ever anything I can do to serve these congregations, Lord, you know I will. And I just ask for your blessing, and I really mean that, Lord, deposit something of value in each of these locations, Father, in each home represented here. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask these things. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, and I really meant that prayer. If there's ever anything I can do to serve you, don't hesitate to contact me. Bless you.